Welcome everyone to the Complexity Colloquium. Today, I have the pleasure to, to introduce David Wolpert. He's a professor at the Santa Fe Institute, and he's also affiliated with Complexity Science Club and Arizona State University. And he has many contributions to complexity science. Perhaps some of the most well-known are the Northrop Lange theorems. And uh, well, he will speak today about the stochastic thermodynamics of computation. Please, David. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. So um, I guess I can start first from a sort of a historical, sociological point of view. Um, physicists have been worrying about the relationship between um, information transformation, information processing, what we could now call computation, and well, actually, ultimately, the fundamental nature of reality, but certainly at a minimum, the relationship between computation and thermodynamics, arguably since Maxwell's demon, a century and a half. Um, there were some important contributions that were made by people like Rolf Landauer, Charlie Bennett, and so on in the second half of the 20th century. But all through, um, until very recently, people have had a major problem. If you look at Rolf Landauer's papers, you will see um, his first one, um, you'll actually find almost no equations. And the problem is that statistical physics was pretty much concerned only with static systems, very often just equilibrium systems, really throughout the 20th century. But if there's one clearly very fundamental foundational definition of systems that do any kind of computation, transformation of, of information, um, basically anything that's a complex system, because that's not static, it's dynamic, it's changing. And we did not have the tools to actually um, talk about the thermodynamics of such systems until in the past couple of decades, there's been essentially a revolution in non-equilibrium statistical physics. One part of it is what's called stochastic thermodynamics, which has now provided us the tools for analyzing the thermodynamic properties of arbitrarily far off equilibrium evolving systems, and therefore provides us the tools to really, for the first time, start to analyze what's going on in information processing or computation more generally. And so what I'll be presenting today is just a, a few um, um, examples of uh, first stochastic thermodynamics, because I assume since it's so new that many people aren't really um, uh, conversant with it, but then also at a very high level indicate some of its implications for our understanding of computation. I don't expect people to understand the details of what I'm presenting. I'm going to be having more equations on my slides than people can absorb, because I want to sort of give you from a high level perspective, kind of the feel of the field more than any um, particular from um, uh, completely um, nailed down um, theorems and so on, which would probably take too much time for this one hour that I have. Um, okay, so uh, away we go, um, I think. Come on, machine. Well, maybe we don't. <laughs> Perhaps oh, if you select the screen. Oh, now, huh, it's just very slow. That's strange, okay, yep. yeah. PDF and Zoom, these various, anyway. So consider any, um, uh, master equation, any um, Markov process in continuous time um, that can be varying in time as well, the uh, rate matrix of the equation. So I don't know, can people see as I move around my hand, the hand on the screen? Yeah. So here is, um, for simplicity, we'll say it's going to be a countable space with a set of states, some um, uh, i and j and so on. And the evolution of the, the, of the um, probability distribution is just given by a mark of just linear. You can't possibly get simpler. This is the foundation of everything from Foucault-Planck, Langevin dynamics. Um, so all models are everything from financial systems. You can um, a model opinion network um, dynamics using these kinds of equations. And many, many physics systems um, are, can be analyzed as obeying this kind of a, a dynamics. In particular, you can talk about potentially noisy dynamics of a Turing machine, 
This is what gates in the circuit, um, the entire circuit as a whole, spike trains going down an axon, um, for that matter, multiple neurons um, communicating with one another, in neuronal assemblies, genetic networks evolving, really just about everything and anything. So um, just because we love Claude Shannon so much, he did so many things, let's just see what happens if you um, evolve his entropy under this particular dynamics. Bizarrely, this had never been done actually until a couple of days ago, a couple of decades ago. Here's the result. The time derivative of the Shan entropy is a, can be written as the sum of two terms. These are the rate matrices, these Ks, that's the same rate matrix there. These Ps, notice there's some Ps in this one, but there's not in that one. That is the current probability distribution. The time derivative of the Shan entropy can be written as the sum of these two terms. This one, for reasons that I'll make clear in a second, is called the entropy flow rate. This is called the entropy production rate. It has, it's actually not too difficult to prove. This is non-negative no matter what your rate matrix. This cannot be less than zero. That actually is the second law of thermodynamics. I've just, in essence, proven it to you. And let me walk you through that a little bit. This, by the way, it's a really great paper. I highly recommend it. You can read it in just several hours and um, get a pretty good um, understanding of what some of the more um, fundamental um, aspects of uh, stochastic thermodynamics are. So let me um, uh, unpack what I just said a little bit. Um, here's the master equation. Here is the um, time derivative of the Shannon entropy. We just integrate this over time. And what you get is this formula. Negative delta Q, that's called the um, entropy flow from the system between, we're doing it from T0 to T1, between T0 and T1. Delta S is the change in the Shannon entropy. And this, because um, my sigma dot is non-negative, its integral is going to be non-negative. Okay? So this actually immediately gives us what is um, sometimes called the generalized Landauer bound. So let me um, walk through this a little bit. Let's now say we're talking about a physical system. So PI is going to be um, the states of some countable, say a spin glass, a genetic network, whatever you want. And let's say it's connected to multiple thermodynamic reservoirs, multiple heat baths at different temperatures, for example. So KT is not even uniquely defined. Chemical reservoirs, whatever you want, an arbitrary kind of a um, thermodynamic setup. So arbitrary number of states, arbitrary initial distribution, arbitrary dynamics, plug it into our formula, entropy is non-negative. So you immediately get what's called the generalized Landauer's bound. And I'll explain its physical significance in a little bit. It says this entropy flow term, this thing right here, because that's non-negative, the entropy production is non-negative, this is lower bounded by the drop in entropy from time zero to time one in your process. Then if you assume a technical condition of physics, what's called local detail balance, it turns out that the entropy flow is a heat flow in the sense of thermodynamic heat. So this is energy now flowing into the environment. So what this is saying is that the temperature normalized heat flow into the environment in any pr physical process that's evol evolving according to a Markov um, uh, jump equation, it is going to be lower bounded by the drop in entropy of the state of the system. To give a single, a simple example, let's assume that the system is evolving while being connected to a, a single heat bath at some temperature T. Then um, the heat flow into the environment is just going to be negative KT times delta Q. Delta Q is this entropy flow term. This follows from that local detail balance condition I was mentioning. Let's say your system is a bit, a single spin. It's got two possible states. Let's say your initial distribution over those states is uniform. Let's also, um, uh, just following up on this, say that what the actual process does is it erases the bit. So that means at the end of the process, your distribution is going to be a delta function. For example, if we say that an erased bit is in the down state, then P at time one is going to be a delta function about the down state. 
Again, you assume local detail balance. So for this particular very, very restricted set of situations, um, conditions, the generalized land hour balance says the total heat flow into the environment under bit erasure is lower bounded by KT log two. This is the result that um, uh, Rolf um, uh, argued for semi-formally um, about 50, 60 years ago now, I guess. Notice though that the generalized land hour bound extends far beyond this. This lower bound of KT log two is not always applicable. For example, if your initial, if your number of initial states is greater than two, you're going to in general get a different value here in the right hand side. If your initial distribution is not uniform, and in general it won't be uniform, you're going to get a different distribution here on the right hand side, and so on and so forth. The fact that you have a log two here comes from the fact that you've got a delta function distribution over two states. So the entropy of that delta function distribution is log two. Okay, and um, here are some papers that talk about all of this kind of stuff in a lot of detail. So already we're seeing some of the strength of stochastic thermodynamics for analyzing computation in that not only have we recovered in a proper formal way, land hours bound, um, we see how to extend it to many, many other scenarios um, beyond the one that he didn't even realize that he was implicitly considering which is that you have uh, only uh, two possible states and a uniform initial distribution. Okay, so what are some of the implications um, taking the, just the generalized land hour bound itself beyond the fact that you can um, apply it to extensions of bit erasure. Let's say that in a real computer, for example, the initial state of our system, the initial state of your computer is going to be a distribution over the inputs to that computer. So for example, when Carlos goes offline and starts tip tapping, typing into his computer, that the specific stochastic process of Carlos is gonna be generating a distribution over the initial states of the computer before it starts any particular computation. So this distribution is fixed by the environment and more generally, if there's computations going on in the background, it's fixed by whatever those previous computations were, some stochastic, Distribute some random distribution, probably distribution over the previous computations. P1 is the ending distribution of your computation. So it's the distribution over outputs. So Carlos is running some simple program that runs some simple computation. He sets up P0, that's a reflection of him. P1 is then um, determined not only by the initial distribution of the, of the inputs that Carlos sets up, but also by the computation. P of x1 given x0, that is the computation, is this conditional distribution. In general, in the real world, this is gonna be somewhat noisy. Real computers do make mistakes, especially if we're talking about biological computers, for example. So notice right off the bat, one very important consequence, which actually has been, um, is being exploited in lots of uh, work on high-performance computing systems. Um, uh, for a given entry production, for the distribution over inputs, that's fixed by the environment. But we can actually make P of X1 given X0, we can introduce some noise into it. We can just make our computation be a little bit more sloppy. If we do that, that will in general increase this ending distribution, which means that the drop of entropy will be reduced. So in general, this is essentially a proof that increasing the noise of a computation reduces the minimal thermodynamic cost of that computation. It will require less free energy of an organism in its environment that's making computations continually about how it should be responding to the environment to be responding with as much noise as it can. Precision hurts thermodynamically. It requires you, when you're going across the savanna, to harvest more cookies from the environment to feed your brain to perform those computations if your computations in your brain are very, very highly accurate with very, very little noise. So that's immediately one implication that comes out of these results. Here are some other implications. I'm going far beyond notions of like simply bit erasure. Let's consider the other extreme of the Chomsky hierarchy, Turing machines. 
Um, uh, very uh, review a little bit of the background of Turing machines. I assume most people know what they're about generally, but let me just walk through this to sort of standardize some uh, language and so on. There are many, many different abstract models of computers with different computational powers, the Chomsky hierarchy and so on. Arguably one of the most important ones, if, if not the most important one, is what's called the Turing machine. And that is the eponymous Carl Turing down there. One of the reasons it's important is um, what people now sometimes call the Church Turing thesis, um, which is formulated in a semi-formal way at best. But it basically says that anything that you and I or anybody else in this call is interested in doing in the real physical world, any computation is already going to be computable by a Turing machine. That's one way of taking what the Church Turing thesis means, um, including computations in the human brain. And uh, no, so far as anybody, nobody's been able to, nobody's actually argued against it. It gets a little bit problematic in, in quantum computation, but certainly up at the classical world, people um, uh, adhere to this, which basically tells you that it suffices for us to say anything about the thermodynamics of computation in general, or us to talk about the thermodynamics of Turing machines. Okay. That's all well and good. What in the world does he mean when he says the word Turing machine? And here is there's many equivalent ways of representing them from cellular automata to arguably even things like epigenetic networks. But here's the sort of standard vanilla, so to speak, definition of a Turing machine. You've got some bi-infinite bit string, sometimes called a tape. And it's um, here it is S. You've got a head which has some finite number of possible internal states Y, one of which use um, label as being special, it's a halt state. At each iteration of the Turing machine, the halt is located some bit in your bit string, B sub T. It's got the value S of B sub T, that's what's on that bit string at time T. And you just then iterate this process forever. Each time T, based upon the current state of the Turing machine, Y sub T, and whatever bit is um, underneath its head at that time, you update the state of the Turing machine, you write a new binary value where you are in the um, uh, bit string, the tape, and then you move the head by up to one bit in either direction on the tape. That's it, that's its update rule, that's your brain. Um, the computation we will say will end, if it ever ends, at such a time that the um, head enters the halt state. And the associated computation performed by that, comp by that Turing machine is the map from the initial distribution over the, the initial bit string, I should say, not initial distribution, to the final bit string. These should probably be in bold, those S's, because they refer to the entire bit string. OK, as I say, this is the standard model of computation. Um, the Python interpreter you're running in front of you is a Turing machine and so on and so forth. Um, it's got some really, from, I would actually make the strong argument if uh, anybody in the call wants to sit down um, ever again where we can sit down at restaurants and talk about these kinds of things. I would argue that some of the most profound philosophy that human beings have ever produced, the actual only in a certain sense advances in philosophy that we're completely sure of are those that have come from analyses of uh, Turing machines and associated things like um, Gödel's incomplete experiment over um, second order logic and so on. Um, here's one example of it. Almost all binary value functions of the bit strings cannot be, cannot be computed by any Turing machine. Very, very simple proof here. It is essentially in one line. So in other words, your brain is a Turing machine. And almost all, in the measure theoretic sense, possible binary value functions cannot be computed by you, full stop. So, and, and the um, implications of um, analysis of Turing machines get far more um, challenging to one sense of reality when you push it even further than that. But so anyway, one of the things that I'm going back to Komogorov um, that people have been very interested in um, concerning that exploit Turing machines is what's called now Komogorov's complexity. So let's say that I give you some bit string and I want your computer, your Turing machine to compute that bit string, say starting from some input space, 
state of, this, of the uh, tape. The comma bar of complexity for any fixed Turing machine is the minimum number of non-zero bits in that bit string that causes the Turing machine to compute that bit string. So for being in another way, it's um, if you want to compute as your output, the first thousand digits of pi, and your Turing machine is going to be a Python interpreter, then the um, Commodore complexity is the minimal program that you could feed in to your Python interpreter that would cause it to pop out those first thousand digits of pi and then stop. That's the Commodore complexity. You can view it as a measure of how complex a um, output bit string is. This is essentially almost based upon aesthetics. There's nothing right here when you, why you cannot prove that this would be the correct measure of complexity and not something else. Um, as we go with a lot with the definitions of what is complex or not, it's really ultimately generated by notions of almost beauty and things like that. Anyway, it's related to Shan and um, entropy and so on. Komogoro complexity is actually one of the, here's one of the cool properties of Turing machines. You cannot produce any Turing machine that can calculate the Komogoro complexity of an arbitrary input string. So I cannot produce a Turing machine that will say no matter what the output of your Python interpreter is, here is that you want it to produce, here is the size of the minimal program that you would give it that would produce that output. Maybe um, I can um, calculate what the minimal size program is that will calculate the first thousand digits of pi, but there's gonna be some other output such that I cannot tell you what the minimal size Python program is that will produce that particular output. That's what it means to say that um, the common world complexity is uncomputable. Okay, so um, let's try to actually make this be concrete rather than aesthetics. Let's try to think of a um, thermodynamic version of this notion of Komogorov complexity. We want to talk about not as what the minimal size string, but the minimal thermodynamic cost to actually compute a given string. Well, thermodynamics, certainly stochastic thermodynamics, statistical physics in general, we need to specify probability distributions for the question to even be properly formulated. In um, algorithmic information complexity, the analysis of Komogoro complexity, one very, very common distribution that people assume for the initial states of the tape is that's basically given by coin flipping. So let's go with it. Let's assume it's got the coin flipping distribution. The Komogoro complexity, actually in this case, it's a very interesting um, uh, how it plays out for that particular distribution. It's the, um, as I said, it's the minimum length input string. You can apply Bayes' theorem and say, let's say I'm given an output of my Turing machine. What is the most probable input? Well, if you do in fact um, assume that your prior over inputs is given by this coin flipping distribution, then the Komogoro complexity is the length of that most probable input given a particular output. But so in any case, that's um, a bit of an aside. The important thing is what we've now chosen somewhat arbitrarily, an initial distribution over states of the Turing machine that we can then use to um, pop into formulas concerning um, thermodynamic costs. So here is what we're going to call the thermodynamic complexity of a bit string. It's the minimal heat flow from any possible initial distribution coming into the Turing machine that results in it performing the computation of that bit string. So Komogoro complexity is the minimal size of an input. And I'm going to basically say to you that that's a beautiful thing to think about, but it's really not something that a paramecium or my brain cares at all about. It does care about the amount of free energy that it must burn to form a computation, the heat flow. Well, if you run through the calculations, what you will find is the thermodynamic complexity of a bit string is the Komogorov complexity plus two new terms. In essence, you can view these as a correction to Komogorov complexity to make it be thermodynamically relevant. One of them, is actually a normalization constant. It's a partition function, this capital Z. Um, uh, it's called Chaitin's constant. It's got all kinds of really cool properties itself. It's something that arose. Um, it's actually got to do with the initial distribution. Um, can we go back one? 
Yeah, it's got it's that normalization constant right there. And that's log of z. And g of v is basically the probability. This is like the prior probability under your initial distribution of actually producing that output. So this is the prior that you would actually um, have um, over uh, the outputs of your Turing machine, given that the inputs are generated by the coin flipping distribution. So we've got here a correction to Komogorov complexity, so to speak, you know, corrections of it in split care quotes to see what the actual thermodynamic analog is, which is what any real computer is going to care about. Um, this thermodynamic complexity has some very interesting properties. Um, oh, by the way, a way of actually understanding this intuitively is going all the way back to Landau, where people have had the intuition that the thermodynamic cost of uh, any particular process is many to one maps. Bit erasure is a many to one map. This, you can view these correction terms as basically quantifying the expected number of many to one maps that would the uh, Turing machine would actually have, have to go through as it evolves in order to produce this desired output V. So that's how it sort of connects up with the whole bit erasure intuition. Okay, so here is a very, very stylized um, depiction of what's going on. Down here, um, that screwed up that right there, that should be a label on this axis. So this is time going to the right. And here, very, very stylized. This is the state of the, um, what's called a universal Turing machine. These are all possible inputs to the Turing machine. They all eventually collapse. These are different initial programs to your Turing machine. They all initially result in um, the output V and the Komogoro complexity is, so to speak, the, uh, it's the length, the height of right here. It's, it's supposed to be in sort of an abstract version that's reflecting the length of that shortest of the possible strings that, uh, that when their input to your Turing machine results in the desired output V. Komogoro complexity, famously or infamously, if you want, it is unbounded. There is no constant that exceeds the Komogoro complexity of all possible strings. And it's not too difficult to prove that. So as I just go through from one string to the next, um, as the output, and keep looking up what the Komogoro complexity is, no matter what your Turing machine is, there's always going to be some output such that the um, Komogoro complexity, the length of the shortest string that gives that output, is going to exceed any value you want, want to give. It's unbounded. The minimal heat flow is bounded. There is some constant. You give me a Turing machine, there, a physical Turing machine now, there is going to be some constant that's going to exceed the minimal heat needed to compute um, a given output for all outputs. It's basically going to be the log of the sum of the lengths of these red lines here. Those lengths are the um, the, uh, the heights of these associated possible input strings, okay? I cannot compute that minimum. It's uncomputable. The Turing machine can actually tell me what the minimal heat flow bound is for some other Turing machine, but nonetheless, you can prove that there is such a bound. Now, even though there's an upper bound on the minimal heat flow, we can ask a related question, which is, let's say that instead of asking for the minimal heat flow necessary to generate a fixed V, and then running that over all Vs, let me instead simply generate inputs at random and see what the resultant heat flow is as they go over all possible outputs. That is infinite. So these, all these kinds of nuances to the notions of the complexity of Turing machines that start to arise when you look at it from a thermodynamic perspective rather than from a Komogoro's perspective. Okay, so um, uh, should I pause there, by the way, Carlos, to allow questions? Uh, I, think, I think we can save them for the end. Okay, good. So at the opposite end of the Chomsky hierarchy from Turing machines, there's what sometimes called straight line circuits. So these are um, digital circuits, bits, um, the, uh, and gates, or gates, and so on, 
where you were making the restriction that there be no loops and no branches. So the most very, very simple kinds of circuits you can actually make um, from uh, semiconductor technology. This, by the way, um, before it was called Turing, this is Claude Shannon. Um, among other things, he liked to um, write, write unicycles and juggle. Um, but, but all these people that have got the photographs, like Komogorov, Turing, Shannon, I suspect that really their aliens dropped down from some other civilization, they're not real human beings. So what they managed to do is just so flabbergasting. Um, in addition to information theory, he did a whole bunch of work actually in circuits. So that's why he is up here um, for the photograph for talking about circuits. So here's an example of a straight line circuit. You have ands and ors and so on and so forth. You've got, in this case, three bits that are input and you got one bit that's coming out of this particular straight line circuit. Well, let's analyze its thermodynamics. So recall, here is the uh, formula that gives us, this is an exact formula, we only get a bound if we're going to um, replace delta sigma by its, um, the entry production by its lower value of zero. This is saying that your thermodynamic cost, the amount of heat you're going to have to expel to the environment, um, is equal to the um, irreversible entry production, the inefficiency of your physical process, plus the drop in entropy from the beginning to the end. Um, notice that um, any one of these particular gates here, that's going to be a P of X1 given X0. So for example, an AND gate, it's going to have a, it's going to be a, a process over three bits, the two input bits and the one output bit. And it's going to be a, if I have an initial state of those three bits, it's going to give me a probability distribution over the output state of those three bits. So an AND gate is a particular P of X1 given X0. Note that if I put that exact same AND gate into different places in the circuit, it's going to have a different initial distribution over its states. It's going to have, I um, uh, forget which are ANDs and which are ORs, but um, uh, yeah, this was a, a um, inverter. So here, I think it's an AND gate, but in any case, this particular gate getting um, inputs, um, oops, sorry about that. This particular gate getting these, these inputs, which are generated um, from the stochastic process giving inputs to the entire circuit, it's going to have a different distribution over its initial states from this one. That means that there's going to be a different drop in entropy of the states of this AND gate from the states of that AND gate. So where your AND gate actually falls in the circuit will affect what its minimal thermodynamic cost is. It will affect how much heat flow it produces. This is going to be true even for thermodynamically reversible gates, for which you're going to have this thing be zero. It's going to be the case that changing the gate's location changes the total um, heat flow generated by that gate, and therefore it's going to generate the total heat flow of your entire circuit. So think about what this means. It means that I, in general, for any desired map from, say, three input bits to a single output bit, there's actually an infinite number of circuits that implement that desired map, that implement what's called that Boolean function. This now gives us a major optimization problem. Since there are all these different maps, they are all going to have, in general, different thermodynamic heat flows, just for the very reasons I was giving you here. That if I change where the AND gate is in the circuit, I'm going to be changing what its thermodynamic cost is, because I'm going to be changing its, its initial distribution as final one. Therefore, we've got a new circuit design optimization problem. For a desired input-output function, find the circuit that actually minimizes the um, thermodynamic cost of running that input-output function. And by the way, um, you could view these, um, instead of AND gates and OR gates, you can have this be, for example, a boot. it can be a genetic regulatory network. There's many, many different kinds of systems. So obvious questions right here. If I give you a desired input-output function of a genetic regulatory network, and I am natural selection, which genetic regulatory network should I come up with to minimize the actual thermodynamic cost of running all of that transcription machinery? Because that's a major cost to the cells. How close has mother nature come to finding that optimal circuit 
um, for expressing those genes of that particular organism. All these kinds of questions that arise once we actually use stochastic thermodynamics to analyze the thermodynamic costs of, in this case, they're just straight line circuits. It's the opposite side of the Chomsky hierarchy from Turing machines. We can say a little bit about this, um, uh, give, give a little bit more formal version of this optimization problem by actually evaluating some of these drop of entropy terms. Um, without going through the uh, details of it, I can sort of point you to the papers. Um, I can say a, a little bit about it in, in a fairly straightforward way. Some notation. Um, I'm going to write I of a distribution over an arbitrary number of random variables. By that, I'm going to mean the sum over all the random variables of their marginal entropies minus the entropy of the joint. This is sometimes called multi-information. It's sometimes in the literature called total correlation. It can be viewed as, a gen as one of the many possible generalizations of mutual information. Multi-information is mutual information in the case where I've only got two random variables. So it's a way of quantifying how much information is being shared among all your different random variables. So given that definition, the question, what circuit should we use to compute a given function, a given Boolean function? Here's a partial answer. Making some reasonable assumptions, you should choose the circuit C prime rather than the circuit C if um, uh, this, uh, do you want to actually minimize this quantity here? The sum over all gates in the circuit of the multi information at that gate, you want this to be minimized. You want to choose a circuit that minimizes the sum of the multi informations of the input distributions at all of its gates. And you want to look at all circuits that implement your given Boolean function and pick that one. Unfortunately, this is, it turns out to be a global problem. You have to be looking at all the gates. You can't locally just try to optimize one part of the circuit, ignoring the other parts of the circuit. It turns out to be extraordinarily difficult to, this is probably MP complete, um, though nobody's proven that um, formally. It's extremely difficult to prove this for even things like the three bits to one bit circuit I was showing before to work it out by hand turns out to be very, very difficult. It's a very nasty combinatorial optimization problem. All of this is arising for just straight line circuits. Um, okay, so those were two examples of um, computers, um, all using uh, Landauer's bound, the generalized Landauer's bound, um, which is crucial. We need to go beyond the, uh, the result that, that uh, Rolf had. Um, to analyze uh, what the minimal thermodynamic cost is for everything from the Turing machine to a circuit, ultimately. Though right, there's a huge amount to be done there. I'm working with some collaborators on questions like, what's the minimal thermodynamic cost of a deterministic finite automaton? So you're going up from straight line circuits a little bit. Um, what is it going to be for like a pushdown automaton? So on people have no idea. Um, nobody's working on that right now. Um, uh, how, what, there's a whole field of what's called circuit complexity. How is circuit complexity related to thermodynamic complexity of circuits in the same way that Komogoro complexity is related to the thermodynamic complexity of Turing machines? All of these kinds of questions are work to be done. It's amazing all the issues that open up once we have these tools of stochastic thermodynamics. But all of those questions based upon the generalized Landauer bound they all are based upon the um, issue of assuming that you've got a maximally efficient process. So delta sigma is zero, the entropy production is zero. They're all based on saying, what is the drop in entropy of your system from beginning to end of your process? But in the real world, up at the scale of computers and brains, this drop in entropy multiplied times KT, that's actually an extremely small value. This is not why your computer gets hot. It's not why your brain gets hot. It's not why cells need to get ATP is to overcome this free energy cost. That's very, very small. In real systems, the dominant cost of the thermodynamics is delta sigma. So it's something we haven't talked about yet. Okay. What determines delta sigma? 
That is an extraordinarily rich issue in stochastic thermodynamics. It's a, um, there's been papers written essentially on this, um, probably 20 of them a day you can find on archive that are related to this kind of issue. All kinds of nature physics, PRL and so on is about different ways that you can lower bound, you can upper bound and lower bound delta sigma by various characteristics of your process. And those are the things that actually seem to be driving the thermodynamic costs of real computers and real brains, rather than these idealized things in Landauer's land. So um, let me just give you a little bit of um, insight or, or feel, I should say, into what some of these um, uh, cutting edge um, topics are. So here's the first one. It's called very unfortunate terminology, thermodynamic uncertainty relations. Um, this, for example, won the um, Oppenheim Award at, um, uh, a couple of years ago at APS. So the young researchers who made an advance on this, Jordan Horowitz and um, uh, Todd Gindrich, they got $10,000 each, an APS medal, for advances having to do with this particular topic of thermodynamic uncertainty relations. So it's very, very important stuff that's been uh, experimentally verified and all kinds of things, and there's many new TRURs that are being developed all the time. Let me um, explain to you what a TUR even is, what a thermodynamic uncertainty relation is. Let's say that um, X bold is a particular trajectory of a system. So, so far we've been talking about the probability distribution of the um, dynamics, but let's say you've got your continuous time Markov chain, you've got your jump process, and it's going to be um, generating a randomly trajectories. So I'm just going to use as notation, X is one particular trajectory that's generated by your process. So we're not talking about things under expectation. We're looking at some single sample of your um, Markov process. In the community, they define this thing that they call a current. It is any function of the state transitions in your trajectory that is odd under time reversal. Example. Net charge flow from an anode to a diode, so that you're going to have a trajectory that's going to be um, through the state space of where electrons are. And um, one particular definition of a uh, current for that trajectory would be the net change in where the current the electrons are that quantifies the charge flowing from an anode to a diode. But it can also be things like net number of times a particular neuron fires net value of predicting coding error signals. Basically, anything that's going to have a net number of is what people in this community refer to as a current. Um, so in many conditions, it turns out that the statistical precision of the current is lower bounded by a quantity that involves the entropy production. So let me unpack what that means a bit. Let's say that we want the number of times a particular neuron fires, say per second, to be statistically very, very precise, which means that the average value squared of the number of times the neuron fires is much, much greater than the variance of the number of times it fires. So let's say we're natural selection and we want some particular process that is cumulative, like a current, to be occurring in any given amount of time with high statistical accuracy. It never varies much in terms of how much that process happens from one second to the next second. That means the right-hand side of this quantity is going to be very, very high. That means the entropy production, which is the left-hand side, must also be high. So what this means is that, for example, in a cell that's, that's detecting Let's say you've got ligand receptors in the cell wall that are detecting a ligand concentration and the current is measuring how they change their state where they're actually measuring changes in the ligand concentration from one moment to the next. If you want them to be accurate, this goes back to the earlier discussion about noises um, by your friend and accuracy is costly. If you want these currents to be high precision to not very much in your biological system, or in your digital computer or whatever, you must pay for it by this non-Landauer term. This entry production has got to be high. Okay, that's one example 
of one of the, the some of these new results that people are developing, even as we speak, that give us um, reason that they give us insight into what actually causes delta sigma to be so large up at the scale at which we live. Another one is what's been recently called classical speed limit theorems. This is actually an amazingly powerful result. Let's say you've got some initial distribution P0, as we were talking about before, that's a distribution over the inputs to, the to a computer fixed by the environment, fixed by the user of the computer, and so on and so forth. Let's say P1 is the ending distribution, for example, distribution over the outputs. What speed limit theorems say is that if you want to implement the exact same distribution, conditional distribution of outputs given inputs more slowly, and that's quantified in a very, very precise sense, if you want to slow it down, then that will actually reduce the total amount of entry production. So in other words, implementing the exact same computation we talked about before, how make adding noise to the computation will reduce your thermodynamic costs, there's other results, the speed limit theorems, which say that slowing down your computation also reduces the total amount of thermodynamic costs. So that, what that means in terms of like your brain and your digital computer and so on, you don't want to be doing things fast. That's why, for example, in digital computers, um, the clock speeds of the circuits in like say Macs or what have you now compared to five or 10 years ago, they're not any faster. In fact, they've actually been slowed down. Instead, we're making the um, people have been working on improving the throughput in other ways, but you do not want to actually speed something up. You want to slow it down because otherwise you, you require too much um, energy, you produce too much heat. And actually with high performance computers, people are worried about their computers actually melting because of the heat they produce. And that's why if you go to HPC centers, they will actually be slowing down a lot of the processors to reduce the total energy budget for performing the exact same computation. So um, these are just two examples, the speed limit theorems and the TURs for um, why it is that the irreversible entry production over and above the Landauer bound is non-zero up at the scale of the kind of computation that we are interested in. There, it's a huge field in, it's a huge set of issues in just physics. Having nothing to do with computation is very, very hot for people trying to figure out what are the other constraints on a process, like um, going fast or going accurately with low noise that cause that irreversible entry production term, that delta sigma to be non-zero and how can we control them? And how does mother nature control them? That is a huge burgeoning field, lots being done, and its consequences for um, the thermodynamic cost of computation, people don't even really know very much. So um, one last example I could come to, Carlos, should I be um, pretty much stopping now to leave time for questions or how should I be doing this? Uh, yeah, if you can wrap in five minutes or so, that would be great. Okay, yeah, let me, I can do that, no problem. Here is another way that um, people have recently discovered, this is work that I've been involved with, so I know this stuff quite well, um, where the amount of irreversible entry production, another thing that can actually depend on is the initial distribution. So everything that we've been talking about so far has been saying, here is a fixed initial distribution set by the user, set by the environment, and I want to design my physical system, my P of X1 given X0, my rate matrix of my continuous time markup chain to reduce the thermodynamic costs for that given initial distribution. But there's a converse to that kind of a scenario. Let's say we've got a fixed um, conditional distribution. We've got a fixed dynamics. What we're gonna change is the environment. So let's say that we first design a computer such that for the input distribution of Carlos using it, it minimizes thermodynamic costs. Fine, here's our computer. Here's the laptop that's optimal for Carlos. But now let's give them to a new user with a new distribution over inputs. What happens? To give another example, let's say that you've got a paramecium that performs a computation 
And to minimize its thermodynamic costs, it optimizes, say, its genetic network or its internal um, uh, proteomics or what have you. So the computations it does are optimized for the environment given by states of one particular pond. But now let me drop that same paramecium into a different pond. So there's going to be a different distributions over the inputs to the computation that that paramecium is doing. What are the implications? Everything so far that I've been talking about, everything that people have been focusing on is fixed initial distribution given by the environment. Let's change the um, process that performs the computation starting from that distribution. But now I'm flipping it around. I'm saying I've got a physical system that's fixed, but I'm going to be using it in different environments. What are the thermodynamic consequences of that? So let's look at the um, simplest possible scenario. Let's assume that your system is thermodynamically reversible. It's got zero entropy production for some particular initial distribution. So this is the initial distribution of the inputs that Carlos feeds into his computer. And we've designed that computer specifically for Carlos so that it actually has, um, it's thermodynamically reversible for him, generates um, uh, zero irreversible entropy production. So Landau is bound, governs this computer when Carlos uses it. But now let's run that exact same computer for some different initial distribution. It turns out that that will, in general, always increase the um, irreversible entry production. You can only design a computer to be thermodynamically reversible for one initial distribution. In general, if you give it a different initial distribution, now it's not going to be thermodynamically reversible. Now you're going to be having the second law is going to be kicking you that you cannot get back the energy you put into it. Now you've got extra free energy costs just because you're using that same paramecium in a different pond from the one that it was actually optimized for. And here's the formula. It's the drop in the uh, relative entropy, the KL divergence between your actual initial distribution and the idealized one that your system is designed for, how that KL divergence changes from the beginning to the end of the process. That is the contribution to the extra entry production. So to give an example of this, that's a very, very strange example. Let's say we have, let's go back to the Rolf Landauer kind of uh, scenarios. We have two distinct bit erasing gates. Each of those bit erasers is thermodynamically reversible for some initial distribution. So Landauer's bound holds if you feed that gate the associated um, initial distribution. Let's run those gates in parallel um, on bits XA and XB. And here's the joint distribution of the inputs to that pair of gates. Let's assume that the, um, the, the marginals of this are such that if I'm only looking at the first gate, then the marginal of this joint distribution is actually happens to be the distribution that's thermodynamically optimal for that first bit erasing gate. And similarly, the marginal over the second bit happens to be the distribution that is thermodynamically optimal for the second process you've got, the system you've got that's erasing bits. So each gate by itself generates zero entropy production. Each gate by itself is thermodynamically reversible. Now let's screw things up. Let's say that, yes, we've still got this property of the marginals, but let's assume that the inputs to the two gates, to the two bit erasing gates, are actually statistically coupled. So if there's non-zero mutual information between the inputs to the first bit gate erasing gate and the second one. That system now, that joint system, in general, is not thermodynamically reversible. Each bit erasing gate by itself is, but the joint system is not. The reason, intuitively, is that if you were to run this process forward in time and then try to run it backward in time, that by using these distinct bit erasing get gates, you would not be able to recover the statistical correlations between XA and XB after you've erased both XA and XB. Those are lost. It's that statistical information that's being lost. That means that in general, the, um, not the entry production of running these two thermodynamically reversible bit erasing gates in parallel 
is going to be non-zero. And that actually is a consequence. You can rewrite it in terms of this formula right there. Formally, since the gates are distinct, the thermodynamic reversible joint distribution is the product of their individual optimal distributions. But if we've actually got a non-zero um, Cisco coupling between XA and XB at time zero, that means that P of zero is different from this optimal Q of zero, and that's why you get a drop in this KL divergence. Okay, so I think I can get my computer to, and so another way of saying this is that modularity actually increases entropy production. So in addition to you want to do things slowly, you want to do things noisily, it turns out that whatever else its benefits are, modularity is thermodynamically costly. So I'll kind of end it there. I had a conclusion slide, I'm not sure where it went, but in any case, um, uh, here's just, uh, I'll put it up here because it's on YouTube so people can come back and look at all this. Here's a bibliography, oops, conclusions comes now. Um, uh, but anyway, let me keep going because I'm out of time. Here's the other parts of the bibliography. So people can go um, download some of these papers and get super excited because stochastic thermodynamics is basically the thermodynamics of any system that's not dead. It's not equilibrium, that's not static. So I would argue actually um, an extreme position would be to say that if you want to understand the energetics of any complex system, You've got to learn stochastic thermodynamics and you're going to have a lot of fun doing so. But without doing that, you just um, aren't actually addressing the um, uh, energetic properties of off equilibrium complex systems. Here are some other papers that are um, relevant for computational biology and so on and so forth. So I'm two minutes over. I will end it there and take any questions. Great. Thank you very much. If anyone has questions for David on YouTube, please type them on the chat uh, and I will forward them. In the meantime, um, you, you mentioned um, Gödel's incompleteness theorems and also the church Turing thesis. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I suspect that these three, let's say, incompleteness, inconsistency, and on the stability of formal systems that Hilbert was trying to, to prove and uh, Gödel and Turing and others have shown that, uh, let's say, formal systems do not fulfill these properties. Uh, I've been recently wondering whether these limits of formal systems could be related to the limits of artificial intelligence systems, in the sense that we are trying to build a so-called general artificial intelligence, but we can't. So let's say we, we can build very sophisticated systems to solve a particular problem, but we cannot uh, build ones that kind of and play chess and drive cars and know how to cook and dance and everything that we kind of do naturally. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether this, this has to do with the fact that let's say informal systems, you basically cannot change the axiom or if you change the axiom, then you need a greater formal system and those axioms you, you cannot to change. add an axiom for um, whether what the results of a particular sentence is. Or yeah. So, so I wonder whether those limits of formal systems are related to the limits of artificial intelligence. And if so, whether we could overcome them somehow, either by developing, let's say, computation over non-formal systems, because I, I, would, I, I would say that all of our physical computers are based on formal systems, because, I mean, I mean they have axioms that we don't change. Mm -hmm. um, and also at the same time, whether that means that ourselves uh, are, let's say, not entirely, let's say, we, can, we cannot be fully described by formal systems. And I don't know whether we could say that, therefore, we, we uh, perform hypercomputation in Turing sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's a couple of things in there. First, right now, we cannot make a satellite that can travel at 500,000 kilometers a second relative to Earth. That fact that we cannot do it is consistent with there being some heretofore unknown law of physics that says it's impossible. 
But it's also consistent with the hypothesis that we simply don't yet know how to do that. Mike may never know how to do that. So as far as AGI is concerned, I would say that the fact that AGI has not been successful, it's consistent with the hypothesis that a natural general intelligence is doing something that's Turing uncomputable. But it's also, there's many simpler hypotheses simply saying that we don't know how to do it. That um, it, it might not have any relation to those kinds of things at all. It's kind of related to, you know, uh, Roger Penrose had been this emperor's new mind when, yeah. um, you know, saying that it's got to do with quantum mechanics and general relativity. Well, sure, maybe, but there's lots of other hypotheses. Concerning, in particular, the business about axioms, it turns out that um, this is getting a bit of far afield from stochastic thermodynamics, but there's some other work that I've been involved with. I'm a collaborator of mine. We actually um, we, we came in second place in the FQXI competition last year. Um, our paper was published as part of that. It's on the archive. It's called Noisy Deterministic Reasoning. And the idea there is the following. All of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, all the stuff about Turing machines and so on, these are results that assume that every single step in your logical formal system is done deterministically with zero probability of uh, a different result coming out from what you put in. That's certainly not true for any real mathematical system that human beings might ever be involved with. Because even if we come up with a proof that Pythagorean theorem, well, we all think that it's pretty good probability that the conclusion holds. For us, there's always some, maybe small, but there's non-zero probability that the conclusion doesn't hold. It's always gonna be true for humans. What would the consequences be if we actually extend the definitions of formal systems to allow syllogism, um, essentially, the uh, modus ponens, to be stochastic, to rather than be deterministic, which is what causes all the impossibility theorems, let's say that it's actually stochastic with a very, very small probability, teeny probability of a violation at a moment in time. How does that change the distribution over theorems in essence? Might it be that Gödel's incompleteness theorem, for example, is very fragile? that if any noise is introduced anywhere, then those kinds of self-referential theorems fall apart. Could be, who knows? But it's, it's actually a very challenging topic. It relates to things like Max Tegmark's multiverses and things like that, because you can also use this as models of the, um, the laws of physics, which are written in the language of formal systems. Um, so, those are sort of like two responses, I guess, to the question about AGI yep. computation and those incomplete theorems. Yeah, uh, Amaury Diaz uh, has similar questions. Uh, how close are we to achieving artificial general intelligence? Can this type of approach help us explore the non computability of the brain? How does this relate to the no free lunch theorem? Okay. Um, I I guess you partially answered some of that, but. <laughs> well, well, actually partially. Um, he, so here's something else. Concerning the brain in particular, this is another project I'm involved with. I do too many projects. Um, <laughs> we have a fairly decent understanding of the computation that goes on in low levels of sensory motor cortices, of how visual processing works at low levels and so on. We can wave our hands and make statements about things like predictive coding for the high level, but the actual truth of the matter, certainly consistent with what you were just saying about AGI, is that we have no blankety blank clue as to what's going on in prefrontal cortex. We say brain makes mind, everybody believes that. <laughs> um, but we don't even know what that mind is that the brain is making. We can't write down that computation. We don't even know how to think about it. And that's what's the, in certain senses, that's the cause of the questions that, that you and, and the other questioner have. So here is a, it's actually NSF is, I'm putting together a workshop on this right now, actually, because NSF wants to put together a program on these issues. But the question is this, okay, we have no clue as to really what the computation is going on. But we could do all kinds of analyses of the stochastic thermodynamics of the real brain. 
what about if we actually flip the question around? Say that the brain is amazingly energetically efficient. We can see all kinds of things into architecture that are, so to speak, designed that way to reduce energetic costs. What if we can actually use some of the machinery of stochastic thermodynamics concerning things like modularity costs, the benefit of noise, the cost of doing computations quickly, and so on, combine that with what we see about the brain's architecture to actually reverse things around and figure out, well, what must, figure out something about what must the computation be that the brain is doing, given that it is thermodynamically efficient. So rather than say, let me try to design a thermodynamically efficient brain that does this computation, which we have no clue as to what that computation is in the first place, let's maybe flip it around and see if we can gain any insights by saying, let's assume it's thermodynamically efficient. What kind of restrictions does that put on the possible computations that the brain is doing? And does that give us any insights into what it might actually be doing? Good. One final question. Gabriel Ramos Fernandez writes, thank you for a very interesting talk. If the connectivity of each element in a circuit can have a different thermodynamic optimum, how does the network as a whole arrive at the global optimum? In other words, is there some kind of dynamic balance between many possible solutions? Um, the, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> as, as I mentioned, the, the problem of actually even finding the optimal circuit for a given Boolean function, it looks like it's actually MP hard, um, but at a minimum, it's human hard, so to speak. Solving these things, it looks like it's a global optimization problem. It can't be localized. You can't chop it up into doing this one gate at a time. So it's very, very difficult to get any handle on those kinds of questions that the speaker was asking. We don't know. If they want to, um, uh, they send me an email and I'll tell you what's known and we can maybe start to brainstorm about how to try to make leave, um, headway on um, getting any further with it. Um, what would be good greedy algorithms and so on and so forth. How well has nature done? We have no clue. Actually, uh, a related question that came up when you were speaking about this is whether you think that uh, genetic regulatory networks in particular, they're known to be close to the critical dynamical regime. Uh, maybe, well, I mean, when you speak about um, optimality in circuits, I would think, oh yeah, that should be critical. But maybe not. And if you ask me why, why should they be critical, I wouldn't be able to, to say why. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what they're. That's a question. I mean, there are many, there are many people make the claim, and it's controversial, but many people make the claim that the brain operates close to criticality. And of course, yes. before it become, became a, a bad um, uh, term that was out of fashion, people would talk about edge of chaos when they were being a little bit more yes. things. Um, for genetic regulatory networks, it's, don't know. These are real, because we, to be close to criticality also has stochastic thermodynamic consequences. And there's very yeah. little that's been done even in physics about that. There's been very little yes. even stochastic thermodynamics of spin glasses. Yes. So these are fantastic questions. Well, thank you very much again, David. You leave us with plenty of things to, to ponder about. And there are many open research avenues. So I look, I'm looking forward to, to see new advances in the, in the near future. Okay. Well,